You're watching Reason and Theology Live, a show dedicated to charitable discussions, debates, interviews, commentary, and analysis. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Law. Welcome to Reason and Theology, everyone. Your host, Michael, on a Thursday evening, we're going to be doing a a uh, different kind of interview today. I'm going to be joined by Abuna Ifram, who is uh, a priest in the ancient church of the East. In fact, I don't think we've had any guests uh, before on so uh, from the ancient church of the East. So I'm really looking forward to talking to him and finding out more about him. He came highly recommended by several of our viewers and patrons. So looking forward to it. Abuna Ifram coming up next. Abuna, welcome to the show, and how are you? Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful to be here. I've been enjoying watching your videos, and your shows really seem to pick up in the last uh, few months. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's definitely been increasing, and I've, I've been seeing that you've been doing some shows as well on, on YouTube. By the way, just uh, go ahead and tell us, uh, you know, what, what is the name of the channel, just so that our viewers can be aware. Uh, Assyrian Faith. So if you go YouTube.com and put Assyrian Faith, and it's... I'm a priest in the Assyrian Church of the East. Uh -huh. um, ancient Church of the East usually refers to our old calendar. Uh, ah, okay. Calendar. That, that's good to know. I'm glad you pointed out the distinction. So Assyrian Church of the East would be more of a, a new calendar, and Ancient Church of the East would be old calendar. Is that correct? In the 60s, we switched to the Gregorian calendar, and then there was one bishop who oh, wow. separated on that issue that's fascinating because i i, I did not know that th this is why we have the show right here <laughs> so that we can learn more i did not know that that controversy um you know existed w with uh with y'all's quarter because i mean that we had that same uh problem ourselves i mean although quite a while back in the uh catholic church and then of course in the eastern orthodox they've they've had a similar issue as well with some old calendarists so that that's fascinating I'm, I'm glad you you noted that um so tell us a little bit about yourself first of all before we dive into the church itself yeah so i was born in the assyrian church i grew up in it um and i was fortunate in high school to be near a church so i could go there for vespers daily and learn to pray in Aramaic and, and develop, you know, skills in Aramaic. Um, and then I uh, spent a good number of years in the, the Byzantine world. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been a priest now in this diocese, you know, it was about eight years. Eight years. Uh, awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was born in the U.S. Yeah. Um, I've actually never been to the Middle East, but I grew up speaking uh, an Ormia dialect of uh Assyrian or Ar it's an Aramaic language, and you know, in church we use uh, classical Syriac Aramaic. Yeah, you know, it, it seems really similar to Hebrew. I I grew up in Israel, so I, uh, you know, spoke a lot of a lot of Hebrew, and from what I've heard, when I've heard Aramaic, it sounds extremely similar. In fact, I understood quite a bit of the dialogue in the Passion of Christ because, I, as I understand, it was. Uh, uh, spoken in Aramaic. Is that effectively the dialect that y'all use as well? Or Yeah. Um, so when I can comfortably make it through uh, the Gemara and the Talmud Bavli in, in the Aramaic, uh, at least the words, not necessarily the legal aspect of it. Um, 
Mishnaic Hebrew, uh, you know, the Hebrew of the Tanakh. It's not that hard. I mean, I studied Hebrew. It, mm -hmm. It's a different script. Mm -hmm. um, but once you get used to it, it's it's pretty easy. Yeah, see, it seems like the Semitic languages they tend to be pretty pretty similar. A lot of root words there, uh, and so I mean, I, I guess one of the questions that I would have is uh, the liturgy itself. Then is it in Aramaic? Yes, so it's supposed to be in classical Syriac. There are a lot of priests who will translate it um, into a modern dialect, um, and and the dialects have a lot of Turkish, a lot of Arabic in them, mm -hmm. um, and uh, but the classical Syriac is uh, it's it's definitely a, a more pure Aramaic, um, and you know I, I have a suspicion that basically it stopped being a spoken language well before Christianity, mm. um, and had turned into uh, a sacred language among the Babylonian Jewish community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And not to to go too far on a tangent, but I, I'm I'm curious. So, uh, w when did they s some of these priests start translating into the vernacular? Is that a pretty recent phenomenon? Yeah, as a kid, I don't remember um, too much translation. So the prior patriarch would refuse to serve um, in modern. He would only translate the gospel, and he would do that on the fly. He would do that, you know, with the classical in front of him, which we still do. Uh, and the dismissal. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd say it's picked up in the last 10 or 15 years. And um, it's, you know, I think it's also part of kind of the struggle of figuring ourselves out also at, at, at this juncture in our history where, you know, we, we've had the it's kind of conclusion of a century of moving from mountains in, in southern Turkey to uh, towns and into cities in Iran and Iraq and Syria, and then from there to the West. And, uh, you know, our, our church really, it's built out of the system of schools. So you had schools in Nisibis and Edessa, probably before Christianity as, as you know, Judaic academies that then received Christianity. And then you have the, the school where St. Ephraim is and um, in Nisibis and Edessa. And and that school tradition really is is a part of I, our our life, and you know that's been kind of eroded over the last four or five hundred years. But then when you have a sacred language like Aramaic, that you know it's part and parcel of this idea that you know, to be a Christian is, is kind of answer a call to get to worship God. And mm. you know, how are you going to worship Him? You're going to pick up the book and read what it says to say in the morning, read what it says to say in the evening. Um, but to do that, you you have to kind of grow up with it, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So go ahead and tell us about the church itself. Uh, tell us a little bit about its background, history, stuff like that. So I think the traditional way of describing would be to say it's the Christianity as it grew in the Persian Empire. So you have Christianity in the Roman Empire, you know that story well. And then at the time of the apostles, they go east of course you have the silk road that's connecting places like uh the capital of Tang china with uh central asia with the tangu tribes and turkic tribes down through you know the huge persian empire that's there in um in modern day iraq and one of the crucial roads for that area is edessa so edessa's so southeastern turkey uh today it's san Lorfa. In, in Turkey and Edessa has a kingdom and that kingdom has a king that that requests from Christ his presence Christ sends apostles and then um, the east is discipled that way now the church because it's in the Persian Empire it's removed from the Roman Empire and I think that's how ba that's how the basic narrative has been I have more than a suspicion I, I, I've I've got some research on this. I want to develop this more. That actually, the the main divide in Christianity comes from before Christianity. You know, what we consider Christianity and Judaism—that's something that starts around 200. Before then, you have this Abrahamic faith, this belief in Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah within it, and then the destruction of the temple, and you know, the, the series of unpacking of huge knots that, that that's going on and. And we don't have like tremendous amounts of 
of writing. We've got writing, but you, you do want more, you know. Um, but I think that before the time of Christ, you have a Babylonian community and a Jerusalem slash Alexandria community. And I base that off the Septuagint over in, in the West or in the Alexandria, Jerusalem area, and then the Pshutta, the, this Aramaic translation. Um, because you've got enough of a Jewish presence in Mesopotamia by the time of Christ that already the kingdom that's there has converted to Judaism, kingdom of Adiabin, uh, which is northern Iraq, which the Syrian people kind of that area. You've got the Assyrian conviction that, you know, we received the God of Abraham in the time of Jonah. Um, and, and, and that's deep. I mean, by the time St. Ephraim in the 300s is talking about the conversion of Nineveh, um, th this is something that, that you know, he's looking back on as, as uh, kind of in the bones, you know. Um, and, and I think it was. I think whether Jonah is right there at the time of Jeroboam the second, or Jonah go, the story of Jonah is describing this this conversion towards the worship of um, the God of Abraham. You know, it's it's there before the time of Christ, and then it becomes a messianic, you know, an acceptance of Jesus as the Messiah. Um, so you have this Babylonian versus Jerusalem, um, Alexandria centers of scripture, right? Centers of scriptural scholarship. And Babylon likes to send apostles to um, Jerusalem. So a lot of the early, you know, before the time of Christ, the Sanhedrin was established by guys like Hillel, um, like uh, Shemaiah and Aftalion, who are coming from Babylon. Shemaiah and Aftalion are descendants from um, Sennacherib the king. Um, and, uh, and, and so you've got this already, I think, this division in um just just within like let's say the 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 soil out of which christianity comes and i think that goes all the way down to the time of nestorus and cyril i think that's also in the background here um and and it's just a part that i don't know why you know we haven't really explored that in christian history and and kind of developing that you know what's going on at the time of christ what what what's leading up to to all these conflicted positions that that he's in the middle of you know one of the questions that i'm curious about as far as distinctives um as i understand correctly i, I believe y'all affirm the first and second ecumenical councils correct and the fourth yes in, in the fourth okay but it would be the third that, that you would you would have right. questions about correct tell me a little bit about that and, and just kind of the history behind that so Alexandria has a tradition of more philosophical Hellenistic interpretation. Babylon, Mesopotamia has a tradition of legal scholarship, right? So the Talmud Bavli, think about that. You know, they, and, and the way I would describe it is th think of this as, as kind of more Judaic, more be you know, based on uh, schools of, of Oreta, of Torah over in, in in Mesopotamia, and think of it as the philosopher, you know, the, the Jewish philosopher in uh, with, with guys like Philo. And that's going to change your concept of anthropology, of God and man, you know, and also the Babylonian tradition is one of, uh, of synagogue, of worshiping God through holy word, because they're removed from the temple. Uh, they didn't go back, right, they're in Babylon and of sanctifying things through the word, which also becomes legalistic, right? And I think in a good way, you know, God gave us his will. We do it, we connect to him. Wonderful, that, that, that's so awesome. He gave us his name. We can treat it as something sacred and therefore have something sacred to sanctify us. And whereas the Jerusalem thing, it tends to be more philosophical. And that running in the background, you have the question of, you know, Jesus. Okay, we have the Trinity and now what do we do with that? And I think what should have been a good, almost rabbinical debate, you know, Rabbi Cyril says, Rabbi Nestura says, and here we've got this, this question and we look at it and contemplate because of the politics that were going on within Alexandria vis-a-vis -vis the new upstart Constantinople, ties in with things like economic things, like the Anona, uh, the, the, 
you know, distribution of basically welfare. Uh, Alexandria's amount of grain supplies, I mean, a really complicated part of Byzantine history. Um, and, and you end up with this debate and, and tied into this debate are really complicated philosophical things. So, you know, the key term there being hypostasis, knuma. Well, knuma for us goes back to Ephraim and it chiefly it gets used in describing the Trinity. And it's as God existing as Father, existing as Son, existing as Holy Spirit. But Ephraim also, when he deals with Genesis, uses it to describe heaven and earth before even the elements, even the building blocks are created. God's idea that there be heaven, that there be earth. Um, that basically when God determines something, right? So that also connects up to philosophy. You've got nature as that you know, we, we would we know what the nature of a unicorn is. We've never seen one. Mm -hmm. So we could say that God never willed it to come into existence. So if you take that and someone says to you, I will also add into it that the two schools have two different enemies. Alexandria, their enemy is Arianism. Antioch, their enemy is Apollinarianism. What does Apollinaris says? The one nature of God, the Word incarnate. Mia physis tu theologus es arcomenon. Well, what does that mean? Well, for, Ari for Apollinarius, it means the logos that is the intellect, that, that is the, um, the neshama, the, uh, the, 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 the nous, the, the intellect of, of Christ is God, the Word, and the body is a separate thing. So when the stories here, Cyril going, Mia fisis tu theologus is sarcomenon. Stories, like, heresy. <laughs> when, when, and, and, and I think, you know, Cyril's going, cool. <laughs> um, I got myself a heretic in Constantinople. Mm -hmm. um, now, I don't think that uh, either Cyril and the were bad Christians. I think they're both good Christians. I think they both died in the grace of the church. But I think the the situation at hand took it to a level where what should have been an argument that leaves us with questions and contemplation became an attempt to try to crystallize a truth that's even beyond human. Um, I, I don't know if we can cut that precisely or, or that we should, at least not not with loaded guns, not with you know having anathemas in our hands. Um, you know, and uh, I would say that that the resolution for us would be that what Maxima says, what he does with will, what he does with kind of putting the toothpaste back in the tube, um, that's exactly what our uh, Marbawai does, um, wh which is to say, like, look, there's a human will, there's a divine will, but there, there's no perichoresis, there's no debate. The human will accepts the divine will in Christ. Well, what's a will? It's an indication of the presence of a humanity and a divinity. Um, you know, what are the properties of a human being? It's to have will and um, intellectual activity. What's the properties of a divine being? Will and intellectual activity. So when we're saying the tuknume, oknuma hypostasis, it's in the sense, same sense that there's heaven and earth before there's a molecule that there be heaven, that there be earth, that there be Christ as man, Christ as God. Well, of course. When Maximus says there's a human will, there's a divine will, but there's no deliberation. Beautiful. Well, you know, you, you mentioned Nestorius there a moment ago, and, and of course, one of the questions that I have is, you, you mentioned that he died in the grace of the church, and so did Cyril. So um, how do you see Nestorius in your tradition? Do you all venerate him, or there's not a veneration, but you, you just don't see him as condemned? Yeah, so first of all, this is, I'm just speaking of from myself. Oh, okay. um, I got you. you know, I, I'm not representing the church because... Um, you know, I, I'm not a holy synod convening. Sure, sure. Um, we're, we're we're just two guys speaking, and I'm doing sure, my sure, best. Sure. Yeah. Um, and and I tend to go, you know, 
crazy and and let me know if if I'm completely skipping around. No, my you're fine. ADD rattled brain. No, so far um, you you've been great. Very fascinating stuff, by the way. I, I'm extremely intrigued here, so I want to hear more. Okay, cool. Um, well, no, we we definitely commemorate Nostorus and Theodore and Diodor. Um, we we have a special feast day for them. We have a feast day for the Syriac doctors, Awahate Suriaye, and then we have one for Awahate Yonaye, for the uh, Greek doctors, which means Theodore, Nestorus, and Theodore. And Theodore is seen as a bloodless martyr. Now remember, we also have had his Bazaar of Heraclides, which the West only got about 110 <laughs> years ago. Right. So, you know, we have him saying things like, well, at Chalcedon, finally, they said the right thing. And, mm. you know, I'm going to shut up because if Nestorus, and now I'm going to quote him, if Nestorus be damned and the church have union, let Nestorus be damned and let God be the judge. Um, and uh, I, I think that that probably is very close uh, to the to the reality. Um, the school of Theodore, the school of Antioch, I think cuts back before Christ. I think cuts back to tensions within the Abrahamic faith. If you want to call it Judeo-Christianity. Between, like I said, this kind of legalistic, let's cut tight to the text, and the legalist community being mystical, which and mystics usually are extreme practitioners of uh, prayer and fasting. You know, they're usually the strictest people. This isn't like the person in Berkeley with the 14 different Buddhas and the cross. And the, th this is the guy who ties his ponytail to a post so he doesn't sleep. Um, and, and, and you get that. When you look at the Pshutta canon of the Old Testament, it's bigger than the Septuagint. And it has stuff like second, all this apocalyptic literature, which makes sense. Um, so I think when it comes to interpreting Christ, his humanity as fully God and fully man, human will accepting the divine will, um, that and salvation. So Theodore's got this commentary on the baptism where at the baptism, his humanity completes um, kind of the human nature at the reception of baptism at John. Um, and, you know, there's something real to the baptism. And I think that that points to that aspect. So I think if we pull it away from it being an issue of are you orthodox or not, and put it into look, they're both orthodox. Now let's actually deal with what they're pulling out of uh, this this question. It's a question. It's not a. Uh, it's not a stop thinking about answers. I think this is the problem we have as Christians. We're so focused on having the right answers, we forget the questions. We read the New Testament. We'll. we'll, we'll well, imagine Christ's answers applying to something before asking, wait, what's the question? What's the question in the context of a Pharisee, you know, in the year 30? You know, what's going on? You know, it's kind of like, uh, what was that um, uh, book, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe? Mm -hmm. When they come up with the supercomputer and get it, what's the answer to everything? It comes up 42. And then it says, but you didn't ask the que what the question is. You know, we we had we kind of do that, um, and you know, if, what if you're looking at something like Nestorus and Cyril. Um, I, I think the question is, what are the tensions in these various communities as they're formulating this? You know, what what can we learn about Christ through it? Yeah, and and you mentioned earlier about um, accepting the fourth council. Now, the fourth council um, does speak of condemnations of of Nestorius, but then mm -hmm. you you would commemorate Nestorius. How do you account for those things of Chalcedon? Well, okay, so there's a very funny manuscript in which um, where you've got the the Dumsa, the the tome of Leo, and they say as the accursed Cyril believed, so we believe. Okay, um, clearly a scribal, you know, fix. But I think what what was going on is that you know you'd have these councils, and then you would have canonical collections. So one proposed one is the Corpus Antiochenum, the, this Antiochian corpus that goes around kind of the world of Antioch, um, and 
we have its reception by Marawa the Great. So in the sixth century, we get this chunk of Byzantine canon law and we say, great, the Western fathers have this, let's adopt it. It's a unifying thing to do. That's how. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, I, I know until Bawai, until the 620s, this wasn't even an issue. We basically, we're okay with the Byzantine thing. Occasionally you'd want to lean on the Nestoros thing so that uh, the Byzantines would, it would put some space between you know, us and the Byzantine slash Roman church and you know our Persian overlords. Um, but I, I think that the commemoration of the school of Antioch is separate from the Christological controversy. You, you've got the Christological controversy in which, look, we, we don't want to split with the Roman church, with the, the, the church of the West. But then you've got the school, as in the, the school of thought, uh, of this kind of, um, you know, strongly, I don't want to say literal, but it's not literal in a, in a kind of Protestant uh, way, um, but, but in a non-allegorical exegesis. Um, you know, this kind of exegeting Christ as uh, it, it, this highly... Um, this kind of opening. Well, here's a way to put it. For us, God's will is revealed with the oreta, with the, the Torah. Right? God tells you stuff you can do to worship him, and you get to do it. I don't know if that makes sense in, in, in the context of this Christological crisis. Well, one of the, the follow-up questions then that I have is, um, so I, I assume then you wouldn't accept the Fifth Council because of its condemnation of the three chapters which, which you venerate, correct? Well, I don't know what we would accept. That there hasn't mm -hmm. been put before the Synod. Mm -hmm. I know that if I was asked to prepare for some something, I would read mm -hmm. the councils backwards as in saying, Look, what is being said at the sixth is operative in understanding of the fifth, the fourth, the third, mm -hmm. the second, the first. Um, I don't think, in my head, I wouldn't have a problem with accepting the seven councils as expressing an ecumenical faith. But at that same time, um, you know, we have to also understand what do we think of it in terms of church authority. You know, I, I'd say a Roman Catholic's concept of the authority of a church over another is very different than, you know, someone in the Church of the East. I, 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 I actually would feel more confident in uh, a Jew understanding where we're coming from in terms of authority than, uh, you know, uh, someone who's, who's in Western Christianity because they'd kind of go like, oh, it's a minhag. Oh, you, you've got a tradition. You're, you guys aren't going to like go and submit yourselves to a Western authority. You're gonna say like, oh, what you believe, what we believe, it's the same, yeah, that's great. And and you have this ecumenicity left over from the Roman empire, we totally, you know, are we gonna let you, you know, tell us how we're gonna pray? Huh, that ain't gonna happen. And, and so let's talk about that church authority. Tell me what authority looks like in uh, the Assyrian Church of the East. What's the hierarchical structure like, and what kind of authority does you know a bishop maybe have or a synod have? Well, so the Holy Synod is the supreme authority. the The patriarch is the bishop of Salutia Ketesfun Salak Tosfun, and and as such the senior uh, bishop he's the one who convokes the synod the synod can't meet without him um and uh the synod is in the model of the judges of israel which would mean that they don't determine what tradition is they pastorally guide the church in living out the tradition if the synod were to say here's a new liturgy this is now the official liturgy. Pull up the manuscripts. See if they're right. If they say, here's a liturgy so that here, here are some modifications we allowed for some pastoral reasons. Okay. But you don't determine what God gave. You pastorally guide. You know, they are madhabranuta. 
they are um, economizers, they are dispensers, but they don't regulate what is dispensed, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, the synod, you, you, you know, what is going to determine what's in our Bible? The tradition. Uh, can the synod change that? No. That's fact. You know, you, you find your best sources. If you got a good source. You got a good source. There you go. Um, I don't know if that helps. It, it does. You know, and I think Catholics would definitely agree. You know, there, there's nobody in the hierarchy that can change what has been given to us by Christ and the apostles. So the, they're definitely subservient to it and in service of it and are to preserve it and guard it. Um, so I, I definitely see some similarity there, but I, I imagine we have some differences as far as, well, how does that play out practically? You know, um, I, I imagine the patriarch and his relation to perhaps a local bishop would probably be different than, you know, a pope and his relation to um, a, one of his, you know, a local bishop in his communion. So could you maybe talk about uh, what, what exactly is the relationship between a synod and a bishop, let, in a patriarch and a bishop? Maybe go over that. Well, number one, we're a family. Um, you know, we're very close. Well, actually, I, last night I was watching uh, this um something on Facebook where this person was really attacking the Chaldean Catholic patriarch who, who basically said, look, we're just a church. We're not a people. Mm -hmm. And I mean, and this was an Assyrian who got really upset. And I know why. We're a people. We have a faith and a faith that made the people. You know, when Jonah called us to repentance, we became who we are. We remain there. Our, our holiest days are three-day fast of Jonah. And so... Within that, that means that the tradition you receive from grandma is going to be what you judge the patriarch by. But that also means, you know, like this is why I say the Jewish comparison works. Um, mm -hmm. I think especially for someone from the West. You know, we're, we kind of know what's kosher here. Um, but because we're small and because we're tied by so much history, you know, they're brothers. Um, so... You know, technically, every bishop is, you know, the chief priest of his diocese. And, you know, the patriarch should be invited to come in. I could not imagine this being done in such a mechanical way, though, because, you know, he is our father. He's the Peter of our time. He's the Andrew of our, you know, we have these complex oriental ways where you can name someone with 57 words instead of one word. Um, and... Um, you know, it's a warm relationship, but yes, every bishop is the only, um, ordinary authority, mm -hmm. you know, so a, a canonically, the case would have to be taken up, um, through the Holy Synod out of his diocese with a legitimate cause, you know, for and, there to be an intervention. Yeah. And you, and you mentioned liturgy there earlier. Let, let's talk a little about that, too. Um, tell me, what, what liturgy do y'all celebrate? So the whole liturgical tradition um, would, would be the East Syriac, I think, right? Um, and uh, there are three uh, Sunday divine liturgies or three, you know, liturgies of Holy Qurbana, of, of, of the Eucharist. Um, there would be that of the apostles of Maradei, Marmari, of um, Thaddeus and Maris. Um, and that one celebrated most of the year until you come to uh, the beginning of uh, the Nativity Fast. And then we switch to the one of Theodore of Mopsuestia, mm -hmm. which is a bit longer, but it's very beautiful. And that one actually has the words of institution. The one of the apostles doesn't. So the one I do most of the time doesn't. The one that I do basically from a few weeks before Christmas through um, uh, Palm Sunday, it's Theodore. And that one is much more Constantinopolitan. Uh, it, it, uh, it, it reads as a Greek liturgy, but it's extremely beautiful. And then the longest one is Nestorus. And we do Nestorus five times. Um, and, and that one's pretty long. Um, I mean, you have to be really quick at your Aramaic to to get that one done without um, dragging out too long. About how long is the, the average liturgy? Let's see. I usually start at 
10, I'm over by 11.30 and I preach long. So mm -hmm. I get through it in about an hour, hour 15. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it yeah, depends yeah. how long you chant. I'm clipped. Mm -hmm. So I know guys who can really, <laughs> you know, they're beautiful chanters, but, they, they, you know, you can make it long. Yeah. I, I know some of my viewers are probably wondering right now, uh, what, what, how do you receive Holy Communion? Uh, because I'm oh, actually, yes, because yes. I've, I've seen different forms when it comes Dear to your Latin brothers. Your yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, so okay. So th this is where I'm saying there are bigger issues. Mm -hmm. We're looking at answers. You want questions. Now, the one to receive comes up, they put out their hands, they receive the body and blood of Christ, then they consume. Mm -hmm. They cannot pick it up and put it in their mouth because then they're commuting right. themselves. If right. they do that, they desecrate it. Now, I'd also add that I've been trying to figure out why Christians don't say the Shema, why Christians don't have tefillin, why we don't. And then I read in one of the tractates of the Mishnah, and it's on Megillah, where um, uh, Shimon bin Gamliel issues this ruling that a Torah scroll can be written in Greek or in Lishon Kodesh, in uh, Aramaic or Hebrew, but tefillin, the mezuzot cannot. Mm -hmm. Why? You'd sit there and go, why? Then, then you figure out why Christians don't say the Shema. Why Christians don't have... Uh, because we don't have the practices of a good Jew to protect the sacred name of God. Right? We don't have the intricacies. It's not just having something sacred. It's also having the, the structure mm -hmm. so that the sacred is kept holy. Because the sacred desecrates you. If you don't treat it as sacred, if, if you go and 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 you're going to receive the body of Christ, and 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 you you completely don't care, mm -hmm. this is one of my problems with the lack of fasting in the West. Honestly, mm -hmm. it's it's like you know you 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 eat your bacon and eggs, you go to church and you're going, how are you going to do that? Mm -hmm. So I mean I think that's a part of it is if you're going to take the body and blood of Christ and you're not going to have it burdened, you're not going to have it desecrate you then you need to have the structure around it. So I would say in our church, because we receive it in our hands, you know, you should be very careful with yourself, with your hands, with your preparation. And I think this is this is one of those things that to me, because we're Christianity is in crisis. No one's healthy right now. Mm -hmm. You know, well, we, we've really hit, I mean, look at the world right now, right? Mm -hmm. We've hit some major problems. Modernism has like emptied out our souls. And... That's why I'm looking back at some of this stuff. And for a church at the East, it's easy because, you know, we've got stuff like uh, ritual defilement. So, like, we have a canon you can't shower before or after communion. You shower on Saturday, it's a mikvah, right? You're, because at this point, the sanctity of the Eucharist is such that if you were to pour water on yourself, even though usually that, that's a washing away of sin, but it's not sin, it's the sacred. You don't wash it. Um, you know, Sunday, you're receiving communion. Are you now going to go and you're going to, you know, work in your shop? Are you going to now, you know, go and like, where is the Christian structure so that the sacred can enter our lives? And, you know, what Assyrians, we remember our grandparents. Like I brought this up at our parish a few weeks ago. And um, one person said, yes, my, my mother would say if to thread a needle on Sunday is to stick the needle in the body of Christ. And someone else was saying that, you know, it's sinful to touch scissors on a Sunday. I said, well, this is actually really deep stuff. You're keeping the Lord's Day sacred. You're making a throne for Christ. So I don't think it's really an issue of is it in the hand or is it in the mouth? I think you should receive in your mouth if that's what the standard tradition is, of course. But... You know, there's the bigger question of, you know, how do we prepare God's resting place when we receive him, you know? Because I really think that early on in that misty early part of Christianity, there was a decision, we're not going to do the stuff that requires the keeping of sacred scrolls. You know, we got a whole bunch of Gentiles coming into this thing. <laughs> They're going to start doing stuff like, you know, it's like the second you tell someone, here's Yud, He, Wow, He, how do you pronounce it? I just spent 10 minutes explaining why you shouldn't pronounce it. Well, yeah, but I want to know how it's pronounced. 
learn Hebrew, you'll eventually know the vowels, and then in your head, you 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 you, you can kind of get the sense. I'm not going to go be, uh, into something that at least 2,000 years hasn't been done by believers, Christian and non, because even the fathers kind of respected that, you know. So when, when y'all receiving the hand, I had a couple. I have a couple questions there. You said that. <clears throat> um, well, well, first, it, it, do do y'all receive this leavened or unleavened? How does that work? Leavened. Leavened. Yeah, okay. so I prepare it the night before, and I keep uh, basically a sourdough mm -hmm. that I just made with flour and water. That kind of, and I've had that for a long time. But um, and it's a dough made with flour. Uh, water, salt, and olive oil, mm -hmm. and it's 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 baked, um, and then um, yeah, people receive like a a fragment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you, do y'all receive uh, the the uh, precious blood as well? Is it yeah. one form? Okay, yeah, uh, all right. And and do y'all do a chalice or intinction? I'm sure people will be curious. Chalice, a chalice. That's awesome. Well, um, you know, you said that it would defile you if you were to communicate yourself. Or I'm sorry, not defile. You said desecrate. you would desecrate. You would desecrate it. Um, let me then ask, does that mean when you say it would be desecrated, um, does that mean it's no longer the body and blood of Christ to you? Or how, how do you perceive it? No, you've de it means you've desecrated the body and blood of Christ. I so see, there is I a see. canonical response from the eighth. Yeah, the 8th century. And the question is, what do you do if someone comes and they put a zuza, uh, a, a, a silver coin, uh -huh. on the patent? Right. The response is, and this is what I mean when I say we get Jewish sometimes. Well, the question is, did they grab the communion or did they receive the communion? Because if they just laid it, then put it aside, you know, and deal with it later. But communum, it's fine. But if they didn't grab communion, like they paid for it, then turn around and consume everything uh, quickly. Stop communing people. Mm -hmm. The principle being, one, one person is buying the Eucharist. And they're, they're snatching it. The second one, they're just, they're receiving and they put their contribution, you know, in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. Um I, I think it's that now that's that's within our understanding. I and mean, this is, I think, something that it's when you go to the Byzantine world, I, I, I think becomes more opaque. And when you go to the, the the Latin, the Roman world, it becomes even more opaque, which is the idea of Christian understandings. You know, what's okay in, in Constantinople isn't okay uh, you know, with us necessarily, or vice versa. So Byzantines, they put water in the chalice after it's been consecrated. Mm -hmm. For us, you're desecrating the chalice. Why would you do that? Mm -hmm. But for them, it's something different. And and because liturgy, it's it's bound with with, with you know it, it's a human thing. It creates a people. And and I want to also talk a little bit about the papacy, uh, going back a little bit to hierarchy and authority and things like that. Um, how does your church view the papacy? What it, what is your understanding of it? Nice over there in Italy, they have a pope, and the Latins they have their pope. Good for them. Yeah, but but you wouldn't like you you know historically, um, you wouldn't see the. Uh, claims being made maybe in the second or third century um, of the papacy as being, uh, I would say, um, organic in seed form, at least, to what we believe today. You, you would say that there's been a rupture with what... Peter and the Apostles. Mm -hmm. So chiefly, Peter and the Apostles is the bishop with his priests, the chief priest and the other priests. Um, and our patriarch is the Peter of Peter's, for us. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the Pope is the Peter of Peter for you in the West. Um, that canonically our patriarch is not supposed to be judged by any other bishop. Um, and uh, I would say it's similar to a Byzantine understanding um, for sure on the papacy itself um, in, in terms of authority. 
Now, most of these structures were taken from Byzantine canon law anyway, from the ecumenical councils. Mm -hmm. Well, what are some of the differences that you would say you, you would have with Catholics? So I think in terms of being able to, I'd say the big one is we're a people and a church at the same time. Um, that means that we're not going to submit ourselves to some kind of external structure. And we know our faith and it, it's with us and it's not, and, and the bishops and the patriarch and all that are a function of that. And I think that's very good for them. I think it's very good for us um, because we're a people, you know, and in, in a people, the law is written in the people and, and it's administered, you know, by, by the structure. Um, and I, I think that's, that's something that can be difficult from a Western perspective where that, that element isn't as strong. Um, I think the fact that, the West, you know, I, triadology, we, we definitely wouldn't allow for the Holy Spirit to process from the sun um, because Marbawai, he writes in his Tawdah on, on the Book of Union that uh, as the Father is simple and the Spirit is simple, but the Son is compounded, being fully God and fully man, the Spirit cannot proceed from the Son, for then would he proceed only from the divinity? And therefore create a division in, in in God the Son, or would he be proceeding from both, in which he would have a humanity? Um, so basically, by way of saying you, you can't have the spirit proceed from God the Son, or else you become a real Nestorian. Mm. I mean, Bowie wouldn't call it a Nestorianism, but uh, you, you see the problem with double procession in, in that sense. Hmm. Well, I mean, I, I see some confusion, though, with, with what we understand about double procession. Um, but but I, I mean, I, I get what you're saying there, but it, it does seem to be reflective of maybe some misunderstandings. I think that that would be a fascinating show to just do a whole thing on that um, sometime. Yeah. L let me ask you a, another one and before we get to some of the chat questions, though. Um what are some of the differences then you would have with Eastern Orthodoxy? So I think on the technical level, little to none. We haven't used icons for a long time. So there would be controversy with how we would restore those. But we also need to restore our entire worship space. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'd say we need to restore being a church that educates its own kids with classical Aramaic so that they know to pray their 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 khudra, their breviary. Because mm -hmm. um, that's really, for us, that's required. You know, morning and evening you go to church. Um, uh, and and that being gone, it, it deprives us of ourselves. Because ourselves are an extension of God giving us, uh, you know, the ability to worship him. And in and, and that we find ourselves. Um. But on the technical level, I don't think the, the issues with the Byzantine world, aside maybe from some minor canonical issues on discipline, I don't think there are any. Um, and I know the Byzantine world you know, rather well. And on the level of, I think, you know, of, of union, that's possible. I would Roma, there's no, that's not going to happen. You know, the whole synod could decide, and the Assyrian people would say, okay, bye-bye. Um, and the last 10 years have really confirmed that. Just, And it's not stuff in the Western Latin church only. It's all stuff in the Chaldean Catholic church, stuff that's said by the patriarch about um, the kind of the tradition, about the idea of Assyrians as a people that, that have really become beyond where they should have gone. I mean, the current patriarch, Luis Sacco, um, I mean, a, a couple months ago was saying like, oh, these Assyrians, they want to worship with these liturgies where they've got cherubim and flying and it takes forever. And, and he started saying some kind of off-color things. And, you know, that this caused a big scandal. Um, and, and it causes this kind of thing of like, no, you know, Rome is not our friend. Um, and And... and 
I think that the cause of a lot of that is trying to create a sameness where it doesn't exist. I think if it was, and I remember saying to Rome, my best relationship with Roman Catholics was when I spent two or three years living halftime at a Dominican priory here in, uh, in Berkeley, because I don't receive communion. I, you know, and I was there as, you know, the, the little Nestorian down the hall, the, uh, the black spot in the Dominican smile. And uh, that was great. We could learn from each other. We could rib each other about being heretics and, 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 having those hard discussions really enjoy learning from them and discovering ourselves better. But if you're trying to be the same and you're not, it's just like, you're not married. Why are you trying to be, you know? Mm -hmm. And what about the Oriental Orthodox? How, how would, how would uh, you view them? Well, that's where it gets really unfortunate because the Cyril Nestoros thing really is operative there, um, especially with the church of Alexandria. Um, I, I think that Assyrians would view them as, as Orthodox. Assyrians view themselves as Orthodox, by and large. Um, and we would not have an issue, I think, with any of them. Um, definitely not the Syriac Orthodox, who we, we see as blood brothers. Hmm. Um, and, you know, you get these issues of just the division, you know, from... Um, uh, Ephesus, Chalcedon, um, and these are all beaten up churches. Mm. You know, I mean, you, you know, Western Christianity kind of beat itself up from the inside. The East got beaten up from the outside, but everyone's beaten up. Mm. So they would they would maybe be more uh, less than favorable uh, to have communion with you, but you said you wouldn't have communion. Oh, well, it would be easiest for us because they're a, a communion. I, I'd say they're the one honest communion of different churches. In the sense that the Coptic church and the Armenian church, they have separate theology. The Syriac Orthodox church has separate, you know, they don't look at the Coptic church as their theological masters. You know, they don't submit themselves to a Coptic catechism. Neither, neither does the Armenian, right? And yet they have different liturgical, they're different full traditions without any kind of submission to each other beyond a common conciliar path. Now, I'm not saying, you know, that might sound like an accusation of the West. It's not because the West has a different history. It's necessitated a different walk. It, it, it's, you know, I, I, I don't find blame easy to fix in Christian history because we're all responding to very real realities. Um, you know, a, a big part of the Oriental communion is, you know, when you're second class citizen, but a wealthy, educated second class citizenry, which we Christianity has been in the Islamic world, um, you know, well taxed uh, because it comes from this, you know, higher, you know, greater amount of education just inherent in the tradition. Like Jews in the West, you know, people kind of like Jews rolled the world. Yeah, because they have yeshiva. They have a tradition of like spending 12 hours a day studying. Well, yeah, back in the day when your typical Syriac village had, uh, you know, a priest who would be teaching his kids how to be reading these books and, and, and reading the scriptures and doing Aristotelian philosophy from 14th century, you know, manuscripts, they tended to do good financially. Hmm. Um. But, so, so what's preventing communion um, with with your church in uh, the uh, Syriac Orthodox Church? The condemnation of Nestorus. I mean, that's mm -hmm. just the condemnation. That that's it. Yeah. So, if they removed the condemnation, do you think that there would be a reconciliation? Well, so the the problem with the Byzantine one w could be resolved. I think um, through a canonical process very cleanly in, in the sense of I can see there being documents drawn up that couch the ecumenical councils in a way in which they're, you know, they're, they're seen to be, this is the common language. You know, it, it's the way I would say, like, how would you figure out what's the Old Testament? Well, you can't tell the Church of the East, you're going to have this list of books. 
you can say, here's the Septuagint. It's what the apostles quoted. And we're going to all settle on the Septuagint, Old Testament. Okay. I'm not going to get rid of my, my Pshutta, my Syriac Old Testament. But I can say the Septuagint, yeah, it's, it's got that commonality. You know, you're not going to get me get rid of, you know, Gilean Eduardo, the, the Apocalypse of Baruch or Fourth Ezra. But I can accept, you know, the Septuagint as this kind of common language. Okay. Well, similarly, if you say, here are the seven councils, here's the faith expressed in them. And I say, well, if you're saying Christ is, you know, fully God and fully man, yeah, that's what we've been saying. And if that's the way that every this is what everyone else has agreed to, yeah, we can agree to that. And it's a common expression, that's fine. You know, I, I, I could see that process very clean. I can't see a process where you deal with two natures and one nature. It's, it, the problem is it's already, what, 1,600 years we've had this dividing us, and it shouldn't have, and it has. And now how do you fix that? That's the, that, that requires an act of God. The Byzantine yeah. one, I don't think. I think that requires an act of humans having kind of recovered from a hard history, putting their heads together. I think that can be very peacefully done. Um, the what the it's the issue of now you actually you know we have different theological formula. Um, I think you mentioned the apocalypse of uh, Baruch there. Would, would, would you say then that that's part of uh, Holy Scripture, that mm -hmm. it's God-breathed? Mm -hmm. and, and what other, what additional books, um, you said Fourth Esdras, I believe, was also, uh, are there any additional books that you would consider uh, as, as being God-breathed? Yeah, so what I'm getting this from is a 14th century father, Audishu, who actually lists the books that go into the Old Testament. And I compared his list with one of the biggest Pshutta Old Testament manuscripts, which is from about 700. And I used that to kind of triangulate his. Now, what he was was the Bishop of Nisibis, which was the chief um, school of the Church of the East. So he really has it set up where he's got the manuscripts and he's got kind of the authority. Because you got to understand, Old Testament is not something that was usually a book. You know, a pandect is a rare word to see it in a manuscript. It means somebody paid half a million dollars to have all of them in one volume. Most people are like, well, I've got a Chumash, you know, I've got a Pentateuch there, and I've got over here some of this, and attached to my Gospels is a Psalter, and I can put it together. You, you know, it's up in your head what goes into your Old Testament. Um, the, the Latins, it's different. You took what Jerome managed to gather, right? So the Latin canons determined by the stuff that Jerome was able to put together. And, and you have the Vulgate tradition. Um, so I think the, the Church of the East's collection was actually made by the sages of Babylon before Christianity, is, is, is my sense of that. And... Um, We've got uh, the Syriac Apocalypse of Baruch, which includes the letter to the nine and a half tribes, four books of Maccabees, uh, Josephus, uh, the sixth book of the Jewish War, um, which is called The Destruction of Babylon in the manuscript, Joseph and Asenath. That, that would be considered God-breathed. It would be, well, it's part of the Pshutta. It's part of the Old Testament. But but when we say part of the Old Testament, what 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 I guess I'm asking is it is part of sacred scripture. God inspired the author yes, to write. Yes, this. Odishu lists Joseph and Asenath right there. Um, Daniel is Ora, little young Daniel, mm -hmm. um, which is an addition to uh, the book of Daniel. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah. And just in point of fact, I, th I think just to clarify, um, from the Catholic perspective, we we actually maintained um, our, our canon prior to uh, Jerome. In fact, um, really? Jerome was was actually supposed to be in conformity with the canon that we had already uh, determined. Do you see, for example, Damasus in three eighty two coming up oh. with our canonical list? So, um, but I mean, so it's Pope the, Damasus that you set your canon by. Well, it's not actually. You you wouldn't necessarily say that 
you know, Pope Damasus determined the canon. Uh, but what he does do is he gives us in a council in Rome in 382, he mentions these are the books that we have received in our tradition. And so um, he, he's really the first one to list them together in that way. Prior to that, the list that I've seen, um, you know, miss some books here and there. He's the first one to put the list uh, that way. Um, but it, but of course, it wouldn't be Pope Damasus who determines the canon, right? We, we would say that God determines the canon. It was simply uh, Damasus is testifying to that. Um, you know, I think that would be a fascinating show to even just discuss the canon because um, I, I think a whole lot of Christians probably aren't aware of of. Uh, your church's position on the canon, and I and I just find canonical studies to be interesting. So I, I'm fascinated by this. Well, I mean, that's one of the cool things about the Church of the East is it hasn't really been systematized in the modern period. And when you when you try to unpack these things, mm -hmm. so you deal with the pshuta, you start realizing, wait a second, this is going pre-Christian because you you've got stuff that. Who translated this? You know, it's not in the West. It's not the Hellenistic world. It's a Babylonian world. Well, you had all these schools. You've got schools in 200 BC. You've got, you know, the sons of Butyra coming up against Tilal in the succession from uh, for for the, the Sanhedrin. So you got schools over there. And it, it, I would say that you we have to also re-enter the sacred space of kind of that that initial you know that the judeo-christian background because you also realize that there's a difference between the five books of moses and everything else because the five books of moses that's the stuff that god speaks to moses on sinai and your grandparents were there and it you didn't just see Mo god it wasn't an optical illusion go ask your neighbor because they also have the testimony. You know, you, you you can't really... It's one thing for Muhammad to say, the Archangel Gabriel just spoke to me. It's another thing for Moses to say, and you saw it, all of you. <laughs> right? Um, and and what that's the place where God's law is given. I mean, Christ, you know, he's, he, he starts right there at the beginning of Matthew, and, and he's saying, gives the, the, this kind of mamar, this kind of rabbinical... Greetings to, you know, this messianic declaration of, of um, God's beatitude given to the people who the, the law protects, right? And and then he turns around with, you know, don't think that I've come to lighten the law, and he takes these hard positions. These are, I mean, you you plug those into a, a rabbinical Talmudic world, and you start realizing these are principles, and he's taking a hard line. Um, which is kind of welcome, everyone, and welcome to boot camp. You know, wel welcome to you're going to really get to serve God, and because you're going to, everyone's being called, and now you get to have this um, relationship with God. And if we're taking it in that perspective of of kind of sacred tradition, we're like, well, okay, you you we know what you know, Scripture as the story as the uncreated, you know, breath of God. It's the Holy Spirit. That's real scripture. That's real truth. Then you got the words that someone wrote down. You know, Moses has this experience, has this vision, and then he puts it into words. So it's kind of like you've got, at that, you know, a hundred million gallons, and someone brings a five gallon, and someone pours it into a five-gallon bucket. You know, and, and, and well, here's your five-gallon bucket. You know, it's, you know, he, God is being breathed into a book. It's a book. And that means that it's part of a human experience. You know, a book is only a book when it's being read. Otherwise, it's papers in a pile. It's it's just carbon. Um, well, there's an experience over in Babylon, over in Mesopotamia. There's an experience over in the Alexandria, Jerusalem thing. And then you have, you know, Latin Christianity coming out. You've got Armenian Christianity coming over in the East. You've got, you know, Greek Christianity to the Slavic world. And it's not just the Bible that's written. It's the culture that that has to receive that. You know, I mean, it's God and his people. Well, how are these communicating? So I think, you know, this idea of like 
Bible canons, and 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 we like to have the, these perfect little answers. I'm like, no, you know. I, I mean, I'm happy saying, sure, the Septuagint. You know, there's some things you, that you have to. You know, I don't expect you to find Joseph and Asenath a great argument, <laughs> right? But I can expect you to kind of know what's in the Book of Chronicles. Um, well, I guess the the importance for me for the canon is I, I want to know what God has taught, what God has said. So to me, it's very important. It's more than just having everything perfect. I want to know what did God communicate to us as opposed to what's just purely, you know, men. Um, when you see it that way, um, I, I think the issue of the canon do, then does become important. W would you agree or, or disagree? Yeah, I think so, and I think that's where it's it. It's the particular tradition too. No, mm -hmm. no, there's no. This is, I think, the maybe the dang, the biggest danger for Rome is the tradition itself is part of the sacred. You can't remove the two. You know, when it went from Hebrew to everything else, it lost a sense of the sacredness of the word. Because you lost the Hebrew. And part of the Hebrew was the tradition of it. You know, my gospel, your gospel, they're printed on paper. That's not worthy of, of the sacred name. Because so we you, don't we don't have we're not chauffeurs. We're 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 not, you know, we're not we're not sanctifying it enough for it to continue with it. You know, at some point in in in, in our history in Christianity, someone said. We're just going to say, Kyrios. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll prevent them from blasphemy. Mm -hmm. So, so you 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 kind of see it as unfortunate, I, I guess. Then that the New Testament was was written in Greek. Am I understanding correctly, or is that not? No, right? I, I'm talking about the Old Testament. So, you know, the Septuagint, okay. just, just the Old Testament name and translated to Kyrios. Just the I Old mean, Testament being translated in the Greek. I mean, Christ and Mark, he 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 gives the Shema. Right, he, he he recites the central prayer that has the divine name in it. Yeah, and in Christians, we never pray it. it doesn't come into any liturgical tradition, um, and and I think the answer kind of suggests itself mm -hmm. because it's connected to the sacred name, to you know the, this kind of you know certain at certain things are sacred in that, and we have the holy body and blood, right? And we treat those as sacred, and we have a, a connection. And that goes back to how do you receive communion? You got this huge controversy about it. That means you're taking it seriously. Thank God. If everyone was like, ah, oh, take it whichever way, I'll just obey my bishop. I'd be like, huh? Yeah, you don't have you have the mechanism. You're gonna obey some man about how you can receive your Lord God and Savior. Give him some trouble at least. It doesn't matter if he's right or wrong, give him some trouble. You know, it's important that that you you care. You know, if if someone tells me because I've been brought up, I don't eat or drink before communion. Oh, it's okay. You know, have a cup of coffee. Here's a bagel. <laughs> I I don't know if I can physically do it. It's ingrained in me because it's it's a part of how we approach the sacred. Well, it's the that that's what I'm saying. You can't. It isn't. There isn't a Coptic right, an Armenian right. It, it's you're an Armenian Christian. You're a Coptic Christian. It's who you are. You're an Assyrian. You, the Church of the East experience, it's who you are. As in, that's how you become a human, is through worshiping God. And this is the, the wholeness of it, from the, the music, the calendar, the, the, the canons, and not the canons that someone gave you. The canons that you learned from your grandmother. That she goes, you can't do that. Right? It's one thing to read about the Sabbath in your Bible, it's another thing to have your grandmother like act like you just you know killed your sister because you touched scissors on a Sunday. Like, well, what, how could would, you have done that? It's Sunday. What, would you say that your your canons are given to you by God, or or were they not determined by by men? They are by God, but that but my point is that they're given to us as God, and I have my share in them. Mm -hmm. To us, not me. Right, it's as yeah. it's as a group, it's as a people. Yeah, um, no, no, ind no individual would would be able authorized to change it. Right, right. Yeah. I, I'm speaking of this this kind of divine, you know, this this life in the sacred. 
Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, Jacob is asking a really good question here. Could one convert to the Assyrian Church of the East? Um, how open is it to converts of other ethnicities? It's very open. Um, no, we, we have converts. I, I mean, by and large, the church has been somewhat uh, ethnic, but that's definitely been broken down. Uh, but the, yeah, we have converts. I'm looking for a, another one here. Y'all go ahead and send them to at reason and theology. Uh, here's one from Saul. What's the Assyrian church's view of Mary like compared to the West? I would say comfortably with the Byzantine. The issue of mother of God, mother of Christ, isn't a theological issue. It's an issue of liturgical expression. Um, which was the point of the Christological common agreement um, between the Church of the East and uh, the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, the way I would put it is within a, an Assyrian liturgy, I would never say Mother of God. The same way in the Byzantine liturgy, I wouldn't want to say Mother of Christ because they imply different things in the structures. So for the Church of the East, she's Mother of Christ who is true living God. Um, she's mother of the person, God the Son, of his humanity. Whereas, so for us to say she's mother of God means she's mother of his divinity. So it has to do with the, the way things counterbalance each other, how things work out. You know, who dies on the cross? God the Son, Jesus Christ. What dies on the cross? The humanity of God the Son, not his divinity. Uh, Victoria here is asking a question. Let me get back to it. Was Christ as child to be adored as God? And how does the uh, Assyrian Church of the East understand the reception of ecumenical councils? Well, Christ is adored by the Magi. Um, and I believe it says God. And you know, you have gold, frankincense, and myrrh. This connects to the story of the Cave of Treasures, which... Uh, it has to do with pseudo-epigrapha, specifically Babylonian, um, in, the, in this chain of the Cave of Treasures, where Adam, when he's expelled from paradise, has the gold, the frankincense, the myrrh. He stores in the Cave of Treasures where his body is laid. Um, and then it's this gold, frankincense, and myrrh that the Magi bring. So I think actually in Matthew, it's a linking back to that tradition um, of the gold, frankincense, and myrrh from Adam. So it's this idea that he's being worshipped with the gifts that Adam brings from paradise. Um, and, I, and I think the golden frankincense and myrrh predate Christianity, the gifts of Adam. I think those are the gifts of Adam because they appear in this literature, right? Um, and, and this is kind of oral Torah. This is kind of, these are sacred stories of the people of, of the Bible. Who, who And it comes into stuff like the Gospels. So you remember, they they... You know, at the time of Matthew, he's got connection to stuff that probably even by the time, you know, Yehuda Hanesi is writing the Mishnah in 190, it, it's already starting to fade, right? Um, because you, it, it's not just the books that were written. Remember, paper is an animal skin. It's an expensive thing to write. Jesus, as a rabbi, has Talmidim. He's formed a yeshiva with these 12 odd uh, students. They don't have books. They, they don't have walls of books, you know. They have him as a sage teaching them orally because they're not in a book culture. You know, the, the codex is just being born. We're just switching from scrolls like wine on sh in, 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 in slots. So, yeah, Christ is adored as a child. Uh, obviously, he's adored by the Magi. And I'd say, you know, going back to these old stories, he's being adored in this way as, you know, the what we lost in paradise is being returned. We're giving God back his gifts in the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. Who are these? They're, they're magi. They're Zoroastrians. They're, they're wise, decent people who are not, though, Jews. They're not. They're from the nations. They're coming from the east. Why from the east? Because that's where paradise was. And Trin asks, uh, well, he, he says it in a comment, but I guess it's a question. Uh, he seems to think that the Old Testament is only holy in Hebrew. Is that correct or is that mis misportrayed? No, so I think the Old Testament was translated into the Septuagint and then later into the Syriac Aramaic Shutta. Mm -hmm. 
I think those are very good for analysis. What I'm saying is that passages of the Old Testament that were written and meant as divine, mm -hmm. um, there it's not just that, it's not just that it's Hebrew. It's that it's Hebrew in the way the Hebrews treated the Hebrew. Right? You you don't have the Eucharist as sanctity is also preserved in us as Christians. You know, I mean, yes, it can be technically a valid sacrifice if the priest is and the people are acting like it's completely mundane. But you're God's going to give you the grace that you ask for. You know, when you take the step of saying, I can't write that name unless I've gone to a mikvah. Uh, this is the holiest thing I can be doing. I'm going to pull out, you know, a, 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 a cloth, a, a, a piece of animal skin. I'm going to have the ink that I made with the quill. When I write this, if I make a mistake on this page, that page is going to be kept in my attic in a very special place I have for this. Well, you have a separate, yes, that's going to be better than your, you know, Gideon's Bible stacked 15 high at the local uh, high school gym's entrance by, by a missionary. Um, I, I would say that I think there is some, some things that, when we go from the religion of a people who are made to guard the word, and it's come out that kind of like this this nuclear blast that comes out of Jerusalem at the time of Christ, and 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 this message that goes out, that now looking back we can go, we've lost sanctity. It's part of sanctity is praying to God in a language you had to train into. Part of saying it's making things difficult. You know, kosher had to do with the temple. There's no temple. It hasn't been one since 72. Why did you still keep kosher? Well, at least they're doing it for God. They're making their life tough for God. Does that sanctify their lives? You know, you can look at some cases and go, well, it kind of does. Part of making something holy is making something separate. Um, you know, you want holy shoes? I can tell you a recipe for holy shoes. Get yourself a pair of shoes. Make them expensive shoes. Only wear them to church. When your daughter's wedding comes up, I bet you you'll use those shoes. You've sanctified them. You've only worn them to church. And um, Thomas asks a question here. For what reason should Western Catholic Christians convert to the Church of the East? Does the Church of the East consider herself the one holy Catholic and apostolic church? Yeah, I think we consider ourselves... Uh, part of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, the holy, we'll leave that to God. Um, I, I think that by and large, Assyrians would find a sameness of religion in the Orthodox world. Um, our bishops and our priests would tend to say that, I think, with Roman Catholicism. Our laity have become more hesitant, and it's... I don't think it's, it's like I said, I don't think it's a nastiness. I think it's just realizing that there's a different walk. Would there be a reason for it? I think there's a good reason for a recovery of tradition everywhere. I think Latins need to recover the Latin tradition. Um, you know, I, I, I think Greeks need to recover the Greek tradition. Copts need to recover the Coptic. Armenians, Armenians, Assyrians, you know, we need to know how to pray in Aramaic. It's not that hard. We should have our own schools. What's the purpose of religious schools? To get someone to open their breviary every morning, every evening. That when it's a saint's day, since you were a kid, you, you should know your breviary inside and out because you do it every day since you were a kid. Um, you know, I I think if we do that, you know, we we come all, that that that's you know, that you can't be going wrong there. Uh, Lyndon asks, can Abuna comment on the Petrine theology proposed by Mar Bawai Soro following Mar Ab Abdishos of Soda, uh, Soba, which Soro argued pointed towards the papacy? So what Soro did is he took um, our very heavy Petrine um, theology, which is, to, you know, Peter is important for us. He's the chief of the apostles. We're applying him as the cornerstone of apostolicity, as in the diocese. Now, remember that it, at first, the church is local. It's the Church of Laodicea. One holy Catholic and apostolic means here. You know, this bishop, 
and it's not even a bishop, this chief priest, Archiares, this chief priest with the other priests and the deacons and the laity as a body of Christ. They've received the gospel. In the gospel, they've been one people. Remember Christ, is he's in a rabbinical structure. He's not liking temple priesthood, and that's an ironic Levitical priesthood anyway. What's the It's rabbinical. When he says, whatever you do on earth is done in heaven, that's semicha. He's giving them the ability to make judgments, right? Um, within that space, right? Within the understanding of first century um, Judaism. With Audishu, he similarly, you're talking about someone in Nisibis in the 14th century looking at the tradition of the Church of the East. So he certainly is not, a, he doesn't a, ever appeal, in his, I think in his canonical stuff, to a papal decree. He does prioritize ecumenical. So even when there's something local, he'll say, and here's the ecumenical tradition. And that one is the knockout punch. So, um, you know, from Odisha's perspective, when he's saying the West, he's talking about the Greek, you know, the Romans, as in Constantinople, Antioch. Um, you know, the Latins are kind of, you know, the far off people in the mythical land of far, far West. Um, so I, I, I don't, I think that the the stuff with, you know, trying to read someone 14th century Nisibis into thinking of, you know, issues that really develop with, you know, uh, um, the 19th century Vatican one, you know, concerns that's the, you know, he's not an ultramontane. <laughs> a 14th century Syriac in this abyss is not ultramontane. Yeah. Um, I think there's one more on here that I'm seeing uh, from Fundamentum Veritatis. Um, uh, here it is. Perhaps I missed this early in the show, but has the Assyrian Church of the East always not been united with Rome, or was there a divergence in the early uh, centuries? Well, I think that this idea of unity developed. I think what it used to be is, well, here, let's parse it out. Last bishop of Jerusalem who was not of the circumcision, as Eusebius puts it, which probably means a practicing Jew, is around 200, 250, right? Um, St. Justin Martyr is the first person who's really thinking of Judaism as a discrete thing that can be separated from Christianity. And he's in a position to be rather on the extreme end. You know, the temple goes down. You've got a bunch of Jews, some of which accept Yeshua Hanusri, Jesus of Nazareth, as the Messiah. Some who don't. I don't think that's the big issue. The big issue is what do you do with Gentiles? How are you're going? You know, we've had converts. We we've we've even accepted them as as righteous Gentiles. We have those like the centurion um, who have a place in heaven, but they're connected through a common belief in a common God, right? And then you have the period of the councils. Well, the Aryans Aryans they don't believe in a common God. I think it's really crazy around the third council, fourth council. Um, but you have this idea of common God belief, non-common God belief. The administration of the church isn't the issue. Are they unified? Sure they are. They never knew they were disunified. Are, are, is a bishop in southern Syria accepting papal primacy? He hasn't gotten Vatican I yet. And he, if he did, he'd probably laugh at it. A, a completely different... You, I didn't know I need to what um, communicate with Rome. Um, you know, is, what this is a concept of unity that really is crystallized from, uh, let's say, I would say Trent through Vatican I, you know, because you've got things like um, Constance and such that also are, are, are part of this, this walk. But, you know, I don't know if 1400s Rome understood what the East really was like in terms of, like, the whole, the flavor of it. Um, so, but to give you an answer that isn't so um, uh, 
uh, oily, um, slippery. Uh, I no, I I don't think the Church of the East has been in any kind of canonical union with Rome in the set in the sense of one checking through the other in mutual recognition, sure. But I don't even think that was done by heads of churches traditionally. It was done by bishops, I think, most of the time. A bishop would come over, another bishop would come. Uh, are you Nestorian? Do you believe? The one who died on the cross, divine or human? No, he's divine. He just died in his humanity. Oh, okay. Mind doing liturgy on Sunday? My back hurts. You know? I was bishop to bishop. Um yeah. Um, you know, I want to have you back on if you're if you're willing, just because sure. I think that this has been extremely fascinating. There's so many different, uh, I think, topics that could could be covered. And so I, I'd love to have you on again to discuss more. Anytime uh, you want to have fun with my ADD rattled. <laughs> insane, no, I, I enjoy this. It, more different it, directions. You ask I, me, you I know, do you like believe in Jesus? And I start talking about you know, the halakha of grapefruit as an etrog in Ethiopia in the seventh century, invite. It's been wonderful. I, I enjoyed it. I think it'd even be fun to have you on for a roundtable discussion uh, with some others. So we, we can talk about off the air and maybe see if we can set that up. I think that'd be really fun. Yeah, it, it's really fun for me because, you know, I think that a lot of these questions get hit from uh, in an area of polemics that they don't need. Mm -hmm. We're just, wh why are we in polemics from 1600 years ago? Um, we're all kind of struggling forward. Uh, and if we can find the same Christ to be struggling towards, I think the, the kind of jurisdictional inter-Christian issues are resolved in the common struggle. I mean, that's, that's why I keep going back. That's why I keep going. We have to figure out what happened from the Babylonian exile to, let's say, Cyril Nestoros. That's the real question. Hmm. You know, uh, uh, what, what were we supposed to do? What's our connection to, you know, the God of Sinai as Christians? Mm -hmm. The God who wants us to do stuff so that we can relate to Because we, we've gotten into so I love Jesus. I have faith in him. Great. We don't practice. We don't. We don't think of you know what does righteousness mean even in the New Testament. Well, they're first century Jews. They mean, did you do the the mitzvah? Did you do the commandment? Um, or if we think of that, if we think of our practice, our common life. I think we'll discover, you know, a question of are you unified? I mean, if I have to ask my wife, you know, are we unified in our marriage? That's a problem. You shouldn't have to ask that question. <laughs> I, I hear you. I definitely think there's something to be said about living more righteously and not just making this a faith or intellect only thing. So I, I'd love to have you back on. I, I'm going to, like I said, off the air, we'll talk about uh, maybe setting up a roundtable discussion. We'll pick some oh, your whole program's so. a blessing. You yeah. pull people from all over and it's wonderful. And I'm deeply honored and blessed to be a part of it. You know, thank you all. I, I enjoyed it. And go ahead and put in, put in a plug for your, your channel or anything else that you wanted to promote. Uh, thank you. Well, my channel's Assyrian Faith. And if you just youtube.com slash Assyrian Faith, you'll have it. It's not, there's one that's like an Assyrian Pentecostal thing. Um, I, I'm the other one. I saw that. I've seen that yes. before. I've seen that. Actual Pentecostals who dress up as Assyrian Christians, right? Is, is that is that what I'm... I think no, they're Assyrians who. Okay, I no, no, no. I, I'm not sure if they're Pentecostal. Okay. There's some kind of. Okay. okay, so I might be talking about something else because I've seen actual Pentecostals who aren't Assyrian who will use um, basically Assyrian liturgy and liturgical garb and things like that. So, uh, <laughs> but I've seen some weird stuff before. So. Really? <laughs> yes, really? I, I'll see if I can maybe find this. <laughs> the, weird, I, uh, the world is weird. And I've seen them do that with uh, using um, garb that cardinals wear. Certain Pentecostals will do that too. I, I've seen them do everything, everything. Anyways. <laughs>
<laughs> Once again, thank you for coming on. Thank, I'll you, have you, on again. <laughs> thank you, Abuna. And everybody, thank y'all for watching. I appreciate y'all asking those great questions there in the chat. Sorry if we didn't get to them all. Uh, we'll definitely bring Abuna back on, hopefully for a round table. I think that'd be really so he'll definitely be back on but once again thank y'all for watching don't forget to comment like subscribe share this on your social media also check us out patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to get extra content and also if you want to support what we're doing here until next time god bless